friends and fans of Frog and Toad, the book series and the television series on Apple TV, today's guest is Mark Evitz, the composer behind Apple's Frog and Toad. So if you watched the program, you might have noticed, like I did, that they didn't go in a jazzy direction. They actually, under the care of Mr. Evitz, with the music, went with bluegrass and traditional folkloric Americana, which I never saw coming for a program that's somewhat set in the New York area, in my opinion. But I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I wanted to talk to him about that. And we're going to share all kinds of things you never knew about Frog and Toad on this episode. You know, so, you know, like those E News episodes, things you never knew about George Clooney. That is, <laughs> that is what this is. Things you never knew about Frog and Toad. All right. So the very first question, Toad plays the violin to help his seeds grow into a garden. Are you the live violinist playing for Toad? Living in the Nashville area, where do you go and what things do you do getting inspired for your composing work? Does it involve the outdoors? And I'm asking that because I'm obsessed with composing outside. <laughs> yes, that actually is me playing violin. Um, yeah, I did a lot of the different instruments in the show. I, I played some banjo, mandolin, violin. I did some piano. But a lot of the the organic instruments were me playing them. Um yeah, I, I do. I live in Nashville, and um, I've lived here for, I guess, like eighteen years, and it, it it's it's an interesting community because it's the the some of the best players in the world live in Nashville. It's a real players' town. It's it's kind of musicians, musicians, and um, it it really does inspire you. And it really does make you a better player. When I first moved to town, I was reaching out to anyone I could that would that was having a live show. Um, I would go down to, there was a place called uh, 12th and Porter. And I used to go down to 12th and Porter all the time and just watch live shows and watch players and see what they would do and how they would approach certain songs. A lot of it, you know, like pop country stuff. But it was it was always interesting to hear how the players would... would um, you know, take take like a, a a recorded song and how they're going to interpret that live, and so there was a lot of inspiration that was happening on that. But this was back pre social media, really, and so now there's like so much social media, and there's so much that that inspires me that I see like I'm you know up and coming players that do incredible things like in bluegrass and country and pop and there are also um a lot of festivals that happen they're outside you're outside you're playing in nature especially in the bluegrass world because you've got these like acoustic instruments and you've got this like kind of wide open spaces and um that 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 is like my background i i grew up playing in bluegrass festivals and folk festivals and you're they're rarely inside. You're outside for a lot of these. Frog makes the most disastrous cake with leaving eggshells and everything wrong in it. But Toad insists it's the best cake ever because his friend made it. In the music for the series and anything else in your career, what are some choices that felt wrong but ended up working great for the music? I was a touring musician for years and I wanted to get into composing and I knew I had to take that leap. I knew I had to to get out of it, get out of touring because it takes a lot of time and energy and and obviously it's just it's a it's it's a career in itself. So by going into composing, I knew I was gonna have to get out of touring. So I left my job touring and I started emailing a bunch of people and um kind of calling cold emailing and finding anyone that would want to go to coffee with me and to where I could just talk to other composers and figure out like, what did they do? How did they do it? You know? So I had, I had reached out to this guy, his name is Alex Garingas and Alex was kind enough to invite me to a studio. So I, I'm living in Nashville. He's in Los Angeles. And he said, why don't you come by, you know, this Thursday? And so I, 
booked a booked a flight and um, <laughs> flew out to Los Angeles and met with him at his studio. And when I met with him, I thought, I want to sound like a composer. I want to come across as if I do this all the time. So I kind of put on these airs about myself that were, I thought were the right thing to do. And in my head, I thought, it's not good. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't tell him that you're a fiddle player. You shouldn't tell him that you play mandolin and banjo. You shouldn't say any of those things. It's going to come across as like too country boy. But in my head, I knew that it was wrong to pretend to be something I'm not. So in the middle of talking to Alex, I just go, you know, I'm I'm a country boy from from Nashville, Tennessee. I thought that he would see that as bad. Immediately, he was way more interested <laughs> because I was my authentic self and I was who I actually am. And he immediately was like, oh, let me hear more about that. And he showed me this movie that he was working on called Arlo the Alligator Boy uh, for Netflix. And he said, would you want to co-write some of these cues with me? This is about an alligator from like the swamps of Louisiana. We, what do we think about like co-writing some of this stuff together? So when I was my authentic self, I actually got work as opposed to putting on the airs and being something that I wasn't. Rock and Toad has a slight country and I want to say almost bluegrass inspiration to the music in some scenes. As someone whose great uncle left country music on all day and night whenever I stayed at his house and helped expose me to classic country a lot, I appreciated how it was a really nice direction because many animated shows then and now follow the same musical formats. How has your background working with country music been beneficial for your composing career? Outside of Rock and Toad, where else has having that genre skill been valuable? That's so cool that you have a family connection to country music because that's ultimately what the genre is all about. My hometown is Paducah, Kentucky. And Paducah, Kentucky is um, interesting in its geographic location that it is halfway between Chicago and New Orleans. Like it's a riverboat town. So it's got this like kind of jazz background, but it also has like some Dixieland that it pulls up. But not only that, it's Kentucky. So it's got like folk, Appalachian music. It's got bluegrass. Kentucky's the home of bluegrass music. The closest larger city is Nashville, Tennessee. So it's sort of a cauldron of different types of music. And this was, this was my background. In the 1980s, my dad was actually on a country music game show because he just knows so much about the genre. Country music was in, and folk music and Americana music is very important to my family. So I think it's awesome that you have this familial connection to, to the, the genre because, like I said, it's, that's what it's about. Um, th those genres are very close to my heart, and it's easy to access emotions and themes that, that that are happening in Frog and Toad, like friendship and loyalty. Having a background in these styles gives my composing, I think, a pretty unique personality. Um, it allows me to kind of explore these in, in sort of a deeper way that I that I've experienced growing up. Outside of Frog and Toad, I worked with Alex Garingas on Arlo the Alligator Boy, and it was it was those kind of authentic sounds, those organic sounds that ultimately drew us together and allowed us to work so easily together because he knew that I had this background. To many, the Frog and Toad books and series may be a cute fantasy world. What they do not know is how well Arnold... LaBelle captured a pre-social media obsessed New York. Frog and Toad is exactly what it is like whenever I have been around native New Yorkers throughout my life. People of all ages asking you to come over to bake a cake, go to the park, attend a going away party for elderly, leaving Manhattan and saying hello everywhere people run into you. I've had total strangers run up to me on the street and tell me all kinds of things, and then we end up becoming friends. The rudeness that people complain about is actually from the mean people moving to New York or the expected types. And when you get into the core of the Big Apple, it's the friendliest city I have ever met. 
had I been involved with the TV series, these are the personal experiences I would have used in composing or writing. What life experiences, imagery, sounds, culture, and more did you draw on for working with Frog and Toad? I'm excited that you've had those experiences in a community because that is exactly what I was trying to emote through the music of Frog and Toad. A sense of community and a sense of shared lived experiences. Co-writing in Nashville is all about one thing, <laughs> collaboration. It's really all like the, the thing that you hear when you go to uh, um, writer's rounds or you go to a show or wherever you are is you want to, do you want to write? And that's like everybody's wanting to co-write and collaborate. And there's a bumper sticker. I see it everywhere. It's like, you want to write, right? And so that <laughs> that's sort of the, the, the personality of Nashville is to co-write and to collaborate. So I took that with me to, uh, to, to Frog and Toad. And like everything was about how can I collaborate, um, with the animators, how do I how do I collaborate with the producers? How do I collaborate with everyone? So, like with the animation, like I'm watching the way Frog is walking. I'm I'm watching his gait and uh, the movement of of everything that the that the animators put so much time in into to. I, I've spoken with Sarah Johnson, who is the uh, uh, director of the of the show, and she told me that you know. For months, she was like thinking about how to how to make Frog walk. Well, why wouldn't I incorporate that into the music? So every time that I would see Frog walking, that's when I'm like thinking, how can I how can I give this some movement with the music? When I'm seeing him, he's got a musical walk to him, and and I I tried to the first thing I would do is lay down a drum and upright bass pattern to the way he walks. And then I'm adding all the other color and the, the characteristics to that anim that, that the animation has set up for me to do. You know, for me, family and friends are super important. And I, I did this with the themes and motifs. I, I wanted everything to feel familial and I wanted it to feel this way. So each character has their own motif or, 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 their own theme. And so I really wanted to incorporate um, that into the the writing as well. The visuals of being outside in Frog and Toad are important to me. We grow vegetables here at our house. I use that experience for several episodes. They live the country life, as do I, and I wanted to incorporate that into the music. The ice cream song and kite song are the cutest things. When you were crafting these songs, how did you make them so they were ready to sing along to at home for kids? And of course, I wrote kids in this question, but really, grown-ups. <laughs> I mean, I, I kind of, yeah, I think I should sing the ice cream song when I go <laughs> to the supermarket. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. The mindset behind the melodic structure of Everything I did with Frog and Toad was based on how can I keep this simple yet sophisticated. I saw an interview with Arnold LaBelle where he talked about the efficiency of words and how he tried to keep everything like really simple and tight. And, and if he didn't have to use a word, he wouldn't. And there was a word avalanche. And he was thinking, how do I find a simpler word for that. And then he ultimately he couldn't. And so what he did was he was like, okay, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce this larger word to a very young audience. But that was his whole mindset. How do I how do I do things with with efficient, simple um sophistication? So I took this exact same approach. My whole mindset around this was I'm looking for folk melodies and I'm looking for jazz standards. What were the similarities? What were the patterns in folk melodies? What are the patterns in jazz standards? I mean, I feel like I have a million books on fiddle tunes and and um, um, jazz jazz standards. And so I took that approach in writing. I would play something that I thought was like right and I would play it and then I would go back over it and I would clean it up. And I would say, how can I make this simpler? How can I do this and, and effectively create a melody that is 
getting to what the emotion is, but also keeping it as simple as possible. So that's how I tried to think in terms for this. I knew that if I followed what was already there, folk tunes and jazz standards, and just make them my own, I knew that this was going to be immediately singable and immediately um, familiar to the audience, but in a way that's, that's, that's unique to Frog and Toad. Arnold Lobel's books mask lots of hidden pain. Raised by his grandparents in upstate New York, the kids at school bullied him. As an adult, he got divorced after being closeted, but died of AIDS a decade after coming out as LGBTQ, so he hardly got to enjoy the freedom of being himself. Like WandaVision's Scarlet Witch, he too created an imaginary perfect world of happiness based on sitcoms he loved. And that's not a comparison that I think anyone else has noticed but me, and maybe a few fans of the books and the series. I pulled that from The New Yorker, uh, where it talks about the background to his sitcoms and everything. Modern day fans see a hidden dream of LGBTQ life in the TV series. And his daughter said, I think Frog and Toad really was the beginning of him coming out. How did all of this backstory influence your composing for the series? How do you feel that LGBTQ fans have a new reason to fall in love with the stories and show? So the goal was to stay true to the themes and messages of Arnold LaBelle's original books and allow audiences to approach um, the characters, the storyline from their own points of view. My ultimate hope was that the audience form their own interpretation of Frog and Toad while they continue to explore the special relationship between Frog and Toad. I think it's wonderful that the LGBTQ community sees the stories as promoting friendship in every form and the qualities that come with the close bond that Frog and Toad have. Support, loyalty, unwavering love, these are all great things and I love that a community wants to spread these beautiful qualities of Frog and Toad. A fun fact about you, you studied comedy at the Groundlings. What was your reason for seeking this opportunity? Do you have any intentions to act, direct, or write comedy projects? I love that you know that. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of comedy, comedy writing, characters, and the Groundlings are great at character creation. I, I think the Groundlings are like the best improv theater uh, for for character creation, you know, it's, it's had some amazing people that have come out of it. Kristen Wiig, uh, Will Ferrell, uh, amazing, amazing uh, alumni that have that have <laughs> come from the Groundlings. So I took advantage of several online classes that they offered during the pandemic, and um, I studied writing and character development under um, greats like Karen Mariama and and Brian Palermo and Julie Welch. And um, I wanted to take a deeper dive into what makes a character a character. And I, I kind of went into these classes. They were, they were on Zoom at the time, but I went into these classes with that mindset that I'm just a composer. I'm not, I'm not trying to act. I'm not trying to write. But I felt like it, it really – they didn't really – care that I was a composer. <laughs> you know, they, they were so great and embraced me. And even though I was, I felt like I was the outsider going in, they, they did not, no one in the classes, no one, none of the teachers ever made me feel like an outsider. And, and it actually helped quite a lot. Um, so each, each character in the show has their own motif and they have their own um, um, sound and perspective. And so with a character like Snail, who was voiced by Aparna Nancherla, Aparna did this really cool thing where it was this excitement and always like optimistic and just like moving and lines like, we're really moving today, we're really scooting today. But if you're watching it, Snail is just like, just moving slowly. I mean, the snail has a smile, but is like moving pretty slowly. Well, I wanted to build on what Aparna had already brilliantly created. And so what I did was the music is like banjos and, and spoons and things that are rhythmic and things that are moving very quickly. And so 
the classes I took during the Groundlings really helped me explore how to do those things um, effectively. And I tried to marry that together with music. And um, I had a lot of fun doing it. When graduating with any performing arts degree, things can go either way. I used to know a woman who graduated from Juilliard and worked as a realtor. It's about so much more than the knowledge. What are your tips for transitioning from a music degree into being a studio level film composer? What was your Berkeley experience like? So right after high school, I went to a college called Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky. It's pretty close to my hometown. And um, I, I met a guy there named Chris Thiele. And Chris is a brilliant mandolin player and um, just a wonderful composer in his own right. Chris and I would play music together, and Chris told me flat out, like, you need to be playing music, like, full time. Like, you you, you should be doing that. Because at the time, I wasn't. I was, like, you know, I was in a couple bands and that kind of thing, and um, that was about it. But Chris, like, really encouraged me. And so <laughs> he did not encourage me to do this, but I, I dropped out of college and said, I'm, I just want to pursue music. And so I joined bands and I toured and I did all these things. And I knew that I had always wanted to go back to school. And so um, I decided Berkeley had an online uh, classes. And so I was like, well, I'm going to give this a shot and see, see how well this works about me going back to school. And so the great thing about Berkeley was – uh, first of all, the community you get, it, it's its really, really great. Uh, everybody is is so good and has their own personality and, and things that they bring. And you get to see these, comp, like, like especially in composition classes where um, you, you, you go, okay, here's how to approach this. Here's how to, to do this assignment to, to where it, it's, it's done and I got all of the uh, requirements met. And I did all these things. And then you see what other people do and you go, wow, this is the power of creativity and the power of, of the, the human experience because nothing sounds the same. Yet it still has empathy. It still has all the things that you're looking for in, in that. And it's, it's whatever that person's life experience is where you can sort of hear that in the music. So it's a fantastic uh, experience to see that in the community. Another great thing that Berkeley does is it has this systematic way of naming things and and um, coming at it from a from its own perspective and and its own own uh, in in the way that an institution should. I definitely have taken that from Berkeley, taken that like what they what their institution has done. Now the one thing that Berkeley tells you to do, but a lot of people don't, is reaching out to other people. Um, Berkeley, it, it, they, they're always saying like, get to know your classmates, get to know, get to know other people in the industry. And a lot of people don't do that. They don't take the time to network. They don't take the time to get to know, uh, they're, they're so focused on, you know, getting an A or getting, getting through the class, you know, rightfully so, I understand. But at the same time, networking, getting to know others, hearing about their own story um, is, is, I think, equally as important. That, that was a real big part of my coming up is that I, I didn't have this institution. I had dropped out of school, so I didn't have that. All I had was taking people to coffee and, and getting to know people and networking. So I think Berkeley is great and it's an amazing institution. And I'm not going to, I'm going to do the comedy. Yes. And so yes, that is true. And you should get to know people. What is the easiest way to make a low budget score sound expensive? So with frog and toad, I used a hybrid approach. I programmed, um, bass and drums and, um, some of the string stuff, some of the woodwind stuff. I, I, I programmed it, but there was a lot that I played with real instruments, and I think this is the key. Uh, if you want to make something sound more expensive, record yourself. Record yourself with a decent microphone, have some good soundproofing, have a good quality recording, but but blend in real things with your sample libraries. It, it definitely 
will make things sound more expensive. It sounds like you've hired players, and it could just be you doing it, but it definitely brings a higher quality uh, to your recordings. I think also getting to know your sample libraries is very important. I, I try to really dig in. I dig into mic placements. I dig into um, kind of what makes that sample library. What you know, they can be expensive, and if you're only using you know the things that they've kind of put at the the first level, I, you're not really getting your money's worth. You should dig in. You should find out what mic placement sounds the best on what instrument. What what uh, makes that instrument library unique. And I think blending your own way of recording with these kind of professional uh, tools really can can heighten your recordings and make it's going to give it a little bit more personality and it's going to make it sound uh i i think it'll make it sound more expensive uh it definitely gives it a, a little bit more of a unique factor and doesn't sound so stock or so out of the box what do you like to do when you aren't working i feel like i'm working all the time <laughs> um I do have a great family, and I spend time with them. Um, I, obviously, I love watching movies and TV and, and doing those things, but also um, we love cooking and, and trying new foods, trying new drinks. Um, my son and I love The Simpsons. We watch it all the time. He, he's He's seen more Simpsons episodes than I have, and that, that is weird to me because I thought I was the biggest Simpsons fan <laughs> finds out he is um but yeah I just love spending time with my family I we have a garden here I, lo I love uh, going out with that I I love eating uh the food from the garden and um uh, you know trying new things with it so yeah I I I feel like I do work all the time but when I'm not I try to hold um those that are around me pretty close. And that's ultimately what I think Frog and Toad would do.